Welcome everybody again to another episode of AdsCast. I hope you're doing really, really well. Uh, we have now broken the ceiling of over 100,000 people following, watching, listening and downloading. So I really appreciate it. Keep it up. Please don't forget to help uh, to continue to hit the subscribe button, to like our content, share it amongst your friends uh, and continue to give your feedback. Uh, and today I'm delighted to be joined by American presidential candidate Daryl Constantine. Daryl, thank you for joining me today. Um, around the world, a lot of people may not know, but the next race is upon us. And 2024 is uh, that campaign trail starts very, very soon. So I'm actually thrilled to have a, f a front runner, somebody who's put their name in the hat already uh, as an independent um, in into that race. Um, I'm curious, Daryl, just to kind of see what your perception of America is at the moment. We get a lot of hearsay. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of propaganda reports of a of a particular view um, outside mm -hmm. of America. Uh, where do you kind of see the country at the moment? What is your main kind of motivation for running and the sort of the difference really that you're looking to make for the everyday man and woman? Yeah, and then just a very quick correction. I, I am running as a Republican. I'm actually at CPAC right now. That's the big kind of Republican convention. I am independent minded. I am unique from uh, some of the other candidates that we've put in the past. And for me, the reason why I am running is to address concerns that I don't see being handled by my party. I think that the United States, like most of Western civilization, is very clearly at a crossroads and we are very clearly in decline. And I think that the starting point for that, we have to kind of go back to basics. And I believe that fundamentally we turned away from God. And I think that all of these subsequent issues that we're facing right now can be traced to that. And so we will, I'm sure, go into detail about some of my specific and unique policies. Foundationally, it's the starting point of we need to make America Christian again. We need to go back to the basics that got us to where we are as a nation, not only here in the United States, but also in Western Europe. And I do believe that Europe follows the American attitudes quite a bit. So I'm hoping that what we can do here in the United States can have a positive ripple effect as we, as kind of Europe reconnect. It's a, it's a sort of new position. We have a certain playbook on the Republican party and the Democrats have a playbook and there's a real sense of gridlock. And there's two sides that are talking at each other, uh, but there's really, there's no proper conversation. And our political expression here in the United States is very, primitive to begin with. And now it's just, it's really collapsing. So I am trying to get Republicans out of the mindset of looking back to the past and how do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? I'm trying to sort of say, look, let's recognize the situation. The civilization has largely collapsed and we have basically a, a very dynamic situation and the future is going to belong to whichever party sort of seizes upon that opportunity and presents a meaningful and strong vision for the country. And I believe that the Democrats are much closer to succeeding in doing that than the Republicans, because the Republicans are still in a defensive mindset of trying to stop the encroachment of the left on the various social fronts and not recognizing that there's really there's nothing left to defend. The Republican Party, like most conservative parties in Europe, has been a functional disaster for their caucus, in spite of the fact that we continue to win elections. You know, we have a 50 50 or so record, but if you actually step back and you look 40 or 50 years, it's very clear that the countries are going in one direction. And that's a natural result when you have two forces and one force is concerned with moving in a direction. And another side is concerned with slowing things. What that means over time is you just have a, 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 a difference in pace of that movement. But conservatism, in order to actually sort of meet the left, we have to actually provide a counterbalance. We have to provide a right wing to the left wing. One of the ways that I explain it is that the Republican parties, God bless them, the conservative parties, 
there's nothing wrong with this, but they are actually organized the way that a healthy left wing is organized. They are principally concerned with the liberties and freedoms of the individual within the society. That's actually really the left wing role in a society. There's naturally going to be somebody or something that is setting the tempo. And that's really what the right wing historically is. It's sort of a masculine feminine is a good analogy. You have a sort of a father figure that sets the tempo of you know which way we're going as a country. And then you have a mother that's petitioning on behalf of the children saying, pump the brakes on some of this stuff. Let's stop and take a little bit more at how this is impacting and how this is hurting people. And that's sort of a healthy dialogue. But the right wing is afraid of actually being a right wing. So we're sitting there, we're, we're basically, we're like this, uh, this sort of pathetic father figure that's pointing to the children about how abusive the mother is. And, you know, that's a natural byproduct of a retraction of proper male leadership. So that's where we need to be going on the conservative side is that it's not about like pointing out this is you look at conservative media. We've been pointing out the same things over the past 30 or 40 years, all of the unfavorable things, all of the unfair things, the way that the media portrays the right, all of these things. But they're not actually willing to propose a solution to that. It's like a, a national pastime. It's like every year we all hit the Twitter and we complain about the Academy Awards and how obnoxious all of the celebrities are. But what are you willing to do about that? And when you actually get to that question, conservatives don't actually know what to do. And conservative media is sort of servicing the fears of this boomer generation and showing them on TV all of the absurdities and all of these things that are going on. But policy-wise, we've never really given the American people an opportunity to change things. So the premise of my campaign is that a democracy can essentially be anything that we want. And rather than spending so much time pointing out how creative the left is in terms of their willingness to change things, we have a responsibility to our base to actually put things on the ballot that would change the trajectory of history. So a lot of my policies do just that. And this is where the premise of my campaign is that I am in fact the only candidate in either party that is running a solutions-based platform that will actually turn the country in a new direction rather than simply slowing it down. And what I've ended up creating, because there's a lot of positions where Historically, I'm sort of upsetting, poking the eye in conservative sacred cows, at least in the Republican Party. Um, things like health care. United States has just had this unique thing where we just we don't we don't like health care. We, we want it to be this thing that everybody goes out and buys on their own. But, you know, I've maintained that health care, of course, isn't a right, but paved roads aren't a right. Public education isn't a right. But the citizens have a right to say things that they would like to get from their government in exchange for taxes. And to me, having access to health care, regardless of your financial situation, that to me is something that's a no brainer for your taxes. So that's something that's, you know, Republicans get very upset about that. But I'm left wing in that stuff. Um, gun control. You know, we have a problem. We have way too much gun violence in this country. And I'm very tough on the culture, and I want to address this problem in a bipartisan way. I want to address both sides of the issue, because what we have is we have a conversation where the left talks about we've got to take the guns, and the right says, no, you can't take our guns. It's two issues. Issue one, the principal problem, is the breakdown of the individual, and that is a result of the breakdown of the family. And we have a generation of young men that are being isolated and disillusioned at very alarming rates. And that needs to be addressed. But then there's also the reality of the weapon. And we have to be willing to look at that as well. And I think that the American people deserve that. So I'm willing to sort of shake the heads of both sides and come forward with something that could create a new American majority that would have the ability to sort of force both parties to adjust. And that's kind of in the type of gridlock that we have, there's sort of two solutions. One solution is that one of the two parties is just going to 
stick their boot on the neck of the other party and just say, you know, take it or something new is going to come in that's going to shake up that system. So I like that about my platform, that it sort of will irritate both sides and it will unlock aspects of both parties in order to create something fresh and new. So my big thing for the left, of course, uh, I'm very strong on defending children from promoting homosexuality. So what I ask for from them, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you health care. I'm going to give you minimum wage. I'm going to go to the table about restricting some of this gun stuff. All I'm going to ask you to do is to step away from the children with the pro LBGT agenda. And that puts them in a very difficult position with their base. When you have somebody from the other side of the aisle who is saying to their base directly, all of your blue collar items that you have wanted, I am giving you all that I am asking you to do is to step away from the children. And if they're not willing to do that at that point, they're going to be isolated. And that's how you play winning politics. Republicans, we want to have a referendum on culture, but we're not willing to actually go all in on an issue. We're not willing to fully embrace that. So we have all of these little policies that will address a very small or specific instance, but we're not willing to embrace the bigger issue. And, and until you do that, you're not going to be able to apply the type of political pressure on your opponents to force them to change. And thus far, nothing that the Republican Party has done over the last 50 years has really done anything to undermine the premise of the left's expanding majority coalition. And this is why you see, even when they lose elections, they don't change. They don't change their playbook. And it's because they're looking at the trends in place and they're looking at a future that belongs to them. And that's going to continue to be the case until we adopt some of the changes that are on my platform. Well, first and foremost, I think that the predatory push of degenerate lifestyles on children is fundamentally sexually abusive. So, I mean, that's item number one for me, is that promoting these things to minors, to my mind, is sexual abuse of minors. And that is how I will define it from the executive branch. And my Department of Justice will prosecute it accordingly. This is actually an issue that probably 90 percent of the electorate actually agrees with me on. Uh, there's a level of discomfort when it comes up because people don't want to take on a quote unquote controversial topic. But when you actually drill down specifically against men and you say this is a binary topic where you have to choose whether or not you are in favor of drag queen storybook hour or not. When you push that button, which is my responsibility as the Republican candidate, that is an issue where you have massive support. It's unilateral. We have an entire apparatus. So conservatives are talking about what goes on in the schools. And certainly that is unacceptable for taxpayer dollars being used to teach children things like gender theory curriculum. I mean, that's like, OK, that's the big bright light. But then there's all of the secondary stuff. So we go to our stores here. We go to Target and Walmart. And you will find books on the shelves designed to be read to two and four year old children, and they are promoting homosexuality. It was the night before Pride, uh, Cinderella, these types of things. So certainly we're right to key in. And there is some buy in from the party about, OK, this doesn't belong in academic sectors. That's common sense. I kind of want to push on that. Like we are getting some penetration on that issue. And I don't want to sort of rest my cap on that. I mean, first and foremost, if we have nothing else that we're responsible for as men, it is to defend women and specifically children from these types of things. So this is more of an issue, a call to men that this is just fundamentally unacceptable. Uh, stopping it in the schools is one thing, but we have an entire culture. It's the entertainment industry. It's Pride Month. It's a month-long celebration where all of the corporate stores drape themselves in rainbows, which is a misappropriation of deep biblical significance. Um, and we push this stuff across the board. So to me, this is like a great example. This is a great example of what's the solution to that. 
right? So this is something that a lot of people don't like. We find this, we don't like this. And this, yeah, and this is where leadership comes in. So we call it the bully pulpit in the United States. That's the president of the United States platform to set the conversation accordingly. And we have never effectively done so. Even Donald Trump, he talked about some of these things, but then at the same time, he takes a picture with uh, you know a, a lesbian academic and gives her an award for teacher of the year. These types of things, you can't have it both ways. You know, we have drag queen MAGA people walking around at CPAC. Again, I mean, people are allowed to do whatever they want, but the party is simultaneously investing in trying to show that we actually aren't against these things. You can't really draw that line until you're actually willing to say, we respect everybody's individual rights, but our party platform is that this is not a healthy lifestyle. And our party platform is that this does not belong around minors. Very simple. So. I've addressed this problem with a very simple policy that bans the sale of this product to minors. It has widespread, uh, wide spreading implications. Obviously, this is going to affect academic, but it's also going to go into corporate America. And this is where you get that gray area because conservatives are very much oriented around defending the free markets, defending capitalism, capitalism versus communism. And this handcuffs them because we have problems right now that are actually tied to capitalism. And if you're not willing to take off your gloves to deal with anybody that's engaged in capitalism, you're never going to address these problems. So that's where I'm unique. I'm willing to actually address these problems. And that's a great example of that. It's a very simple policy. What I'm doing, by the way, is completely afforded to me as a constitutional right. I am not dictating this. I am simply raising my hand and telling the American people, these are the things that I intend to do as president. And if you support these changes, then vote for me. And if not, then they won't happen. You can continue with the status quo. You can go with Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis and get riled up over the same problems and continue having your victory parade over lost elections. Or you can actually partner up with a candidate such as myself that is proposing actual solutions, which is something that we've never actually done as Republicans. Well, it's not that there are fundamental issues of capitalism. I mean, capitalism has very clearly demonstrated itself as the greatest engine of commerce. It's superior in terms of doing that. And my point is, is that that's not my Bible. You know, if it comes down to defending children or defending the rights of corporations, I'm going to choose defending children. So it's not that I'm against these things. It's just what are my list of priorities? And the Republicans, our list of priorities is the Constitution. Constitution, hey, it's a great document. But it also has an ability within it to be amended. And if I have to choose between my obligation to God or my obligation to the Constitution, that's going to go. It's going to go again, secondary, operating inside of the framework that the founding fathers gave us, which is many degrees an ability to change on the go, which is a positive aspect about it. We have one party that has been willing to do that. And they have succeeded in transforming the country. And then you have another party that's trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And it's kind of too late to do that. You know, we can go back, but we're also going to need to make some adjustments to fortify the system based on the weaknesses that have very clearly been exposed through history. I mean, a sort of democracy is a, it's a great thing, but there is an aspect of it of it's the majority ruling over the minority. And, you know, I, I think that we have this situation where it feels like it's a nonviolent civil war. And I think that we do need a platform that can bring the common people together. And that to me, that's an issue where I think the majority of Americans want that, but they might not want to give up the blue collar stuff. They might not want to give up on things like health care. So I think that there's a real opportunity to service the needs of the working people. And that's really the middle area of the country. And one of the premise that the Republican Party has is that the middle of the country is socially indifferent and they're really just interested in keeping taxes low. And I think that's wrong. I think that's a wrong assessment. I believe that the middle of the country is inherently socially conservative because working people, people that have to work for a living, fundamentally deal with natural law on a daily basis. So the ability to sort of expand and create all of these new intellectual thought waves this is actually a privilege that comes from luxury. And the closer the people get to poverty, the more you find that actually there's a hunger to return to God, to return to a basic Judeo-Christian value system that we've turned away from. 
coupled with obviously some compassion and natural blue collar support, natural government programs that are going to be coming in exchange for the taxation that we will always have. Another program of mine, very different. One thing that we know about the left is they have all of these government programs and all of these money set aside for diversity, multiculturalism, blah, 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 and all of these things. And we point to these as these are destructive. Many of these, we have programs, monies that we specifically set aside for single mother homes, where we're actually incentivizing a less functional single parent household than actually keeping the parents together. So the Republican argument is we need to get rid of that stuff. And I'm sort of arguing that, yeah, we need to get rid of it. But let's recognize that the fabric of the nation has already been ripped apart. And then actually, we need to reinforce the family unit. So one of my programs is actually extending paid maternity leave from six years to 18 months and essentially repackaging it as an intact family household credit to where we're going to be paying something like $3,000 a month to help mothers stay home and raise children and make it easier to return to not only a biblical model of a one breadwinner, but economically what represents a higher standard of living. Where you have one parent working and you have one parent at home. That used to be the quote unquote American dream. We've tricked our women into thinking that it's a competition to labor and to make your way into the workplace. And now we've effectively cut the standard of living in half. And women, certainly we want them to have the choice to do whatever they want. But I'm here to encourage and remind women that there's nothing wrong with staying home, being a mother, and inspiring men with your femininity, which is more according, more in accordance with what God designed us to be. Well, I think that's natural. I mean, one of the things that I'm unique about, uh, my views on food as an example, I think that the way that we slaughter animals globally is certainly inhumane. It's cruel and abusive. And I don't think that uh, breeding animals so that we can terrorize them to death from the moment that they're born to the moment that we slip their throats so that we can all buy Big Macs for $2.50. That's a disconnect there. You know, I'm not against eating meat, but I think that it's good that we actually recognize the value of what it is and to recognize what a blessing it is to have a, a proper piece of grass fed beef on the dinner table. And you might not be able to get that for three or four dollars. Uh, and that's going to be moving to more localized food. So local farm, farming, sustainable, that kind of that kind of stuff, which is generally like a progressive thing. I'm sort of I'm with them on that. So I want to definitely come more to that and and deactivate this process of just shipping meats all over the world to keep the price, you know, at three dollars a pound or whatever it's at. I mean, certainly countries. Uh, have a vested interest in investing at home. And I certainly look to continue doing that. My focus, where I think is uh, unique, is that I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the breakdown of the social infrastructure. And that's really what I'm looking to invest in, a robust package of investing in social. Because we, get, you know, we spend so much time on the economic stuff that we're neglecting the real big issues, the breakdown of the family. And these are the things that I actually want to be investing in and encouraging. And we see models like this being used in countries like Hungary and other parts of the world. These are going to be critical choices that are going to define whether or not nations are able to maintain some semblance of identity in the rise of globalism that we see currently. You know, this is one of those things where I start with what I feel is correct morally. And a lot of times we see that this actually begins to solve some of these problems. So what I mean by that is that in my policy that I just positioned about being humane, humane in how we treat animals, that is informed by the fact that I don't believe that we should be being cruel to animals. I believe that we have a responsibility to be stewards over the nation, kind of looking towards that Garden of Eden not that we're ever going to be able to get back there on our own, but kind of looking at that as the model of what we want to be moving towards. And clearly we see a disconnect there. And there is a reality. And I'm not talking about going plant-based, uh, but there is a reality that the amount of resources required to breed and torture that cow to death so that you can sell frozen patties for $3 a pound the cost of that is exponentially higher than creating a similar 
caloric output from vegetables. So a natural byproduct of just enforcing basic humane treatment of our livestock is that it's going to reduce a lot of this stuff and it will lead to a more plant-based diet with a healthy serving of protein, meat or fish per day, which is what we know is best, right? A handful, that's kind of the old generic touches, a handful of protein, eight to 12 ounces, something something of six to eight ounces. Uh, that with a lot of vegetables, that's a much better diet. It's healthier, uh, but it's also going to be much easier collectively on the environment. It's going to be much easier on the collective global resources, water, et cetera. So it's going to have a very positive effect just by simply just doing the right thing, which is saying that we have to be uh, treating our basic livestock that is a blessing for us to receive, that we have to treat them with some some basic level of humanity. So things like that, a lot of these probably really to simplify it, and I know we want to go into specifics, but the simplest way that I can put this is that we have turned away from God. And from the biblical perspective, you know that a nation, when you turn away from God, you are under judgment. You know, things like generational curses. The, the, you can A Christian can just accept this at face value. You do this, there's such and such consequence. But when you actually break it down and you look at it from the secular perspective, it, it sort of, it's also parallels that. You make these types of decisions, it might take your country two or three generations to crawl out of it. So reorienting, because right now, spiritually, we've got an inverted moral compass. And we're actually like projecting it into the rest of the world. So when we reestablish as a Christian nation, we define things like the promotion of homosexuality to children as a humanitarian crisis. We open up entirely new avenues for commerce, trade, positive relations with, you know, the Islamic world, the Middle East, uh, obviously Eastern Europe. So it, it, it sort of it changes everything when you stop making your priority, pushing things that are counter to natural law, counter to nature, counter to what is virtuous and good. And when we stop prioritizing, pushing deviancy and degeneracy, everything changes. So I think philosophically, what the West has been doing is we have been like investing our resources in pushing down, up and up, down. And that's obviously not sustainable, and that's naturally going to lead to shortages of all different kinds. So rather than just, okay, let's turn the water off, I'm kind of like, no, let's, let's, let's just turn it upside down, and let's actually start paddling it in the right direction. So when we do that, it's going to have a, a dramatic transformative effect here in the United States. And again, that's going to have a ripple effect globally. And there will be some pressure. You know, there will be so, – so now instead of putting sanctions on countries – that don't sodomize their children, we're going to be doing the opposite. And this is a crazy idea, right? Instead of forcing everybody to wear armbands for the, we're going to actually do the opposite. We're going to be putting that pressure to go in, to go in the right direction, to be affirming life, to be restoring the masculine and the feminine, make it easier for women um, to fulfill different roles, not just chasing after men to be powerful politicians and lawyers, but fulfilling other aspects of their lives and giving our citizens an actual blueprint for success. And I think I'm sort of segueing, I'm hijacking this question a little bit, but both sides, there's a real discontent, specifically amongst the youth. And both sides sort of feel like they're losing. Uh, I do think objectively the right is losing, but I do think that it's worth noting that the side that is winning, they're not happy either. And I think that's because society fundamentally is failing in our first sort of obligation, which is to provide a simple and effective pathway to a happy life. And instead, we're like creating this confusing obstacle course. So I want to get rid of the obstacle course, not, you know, like pushing people into things, but just establishing a good social norm, a social tempo of, you know, this is this is what we do. This is where we're going. We're pointed towards God. These are our basic goals. This is what it means to be a citizen inside of a republic. Doing that is going to be, I think, very helpful and transformative, again, here, but also globally. Because there's another part of the world that is looking at us, and they're like a little bit intimidated because of all of our money, but they're laughing at us because we have all of these odd military generals and they're kind of you know they're sitting back 
I think there's an opportunity to just reach over and uh, embrace globally around life affirming values. Just to clarify, my stance is not, I wanna be humane to animals to reduce the carbon footprint. I wanna be humane to animals because I don't think it's right to torture animals. As a result of that, it does reduce the carbon footprint. Um, my view on these positions, the science is contested, but I'm not a firm ideologue. I'm not one of these people that has one particular. My personal views are generally informed by what I like to be surrounded by. And I like to be surrounded by nature and wilderness and things that are beautiful. So on that basis alone, you know, all things equal, I prefer that we keep our planet as a lovely, beautiful and natural world for as much as possible to preserve that. So that's kind of how I come to this. I let the scientists sort of argue against the ec the economists in terms of what do we need to do? How quickly do we do it? How rapidly are these changes actually occurring? I mean, there is some reality that some resources, we know that they are finite. And then, you know, the question is, okay, but is it five years worth or is it, you know, 500 years? And juxtaposing that against what is the the real consequences on the economies that, you know, pushing these things on a five or 10 year scale is going to do. And so this is one of those questions where I don't get hyper specialized because, you know, I'm not a specialist on these topics and I'm open minded to hearing what the appropriate solutions are. And I think that that's sort of the right mindset to have to take a measured approach to acknowledge that we do have some resources that are finite, that we do have a vested interest in keeping our world clean, but then also being open-minded about how quickly are these things happening and you know what's worse, to destroy the economies globally so that we can be driving all electric cars in five years. You know, I don't know, um, but we, we, we go into it with that set of principles and we have an open and honest dialogue about it, which I don't think we have because I think both sides are very entrenched for other political reasons in pushing their agenda. And I think that's where a lot of the apprehension comes from the right, because we do know that everything that the left champions, they shove all sorts of other garbage in. And that's not OK. And it would be very clear on that. Well, I do think that we do need to invest in the social infrastructure, and this is a neglected area from the right. This is an area where we have one side that's engaged in these types of topics, and we're abstaining from it. So I want to change. I want to get involved in the business of making taxation-based transactions with the American people, which is a totally appropriate thing to do. This is what tax incentives are. It's the people collectively saying, this is something that will have a positive impact and we calculate that value to be such. So my policy, for example, of encouraging, uh, you know, single, uh, encouraging traditional intact family model with something like a three thousand dollar a month monthly credit. That's a number I'm kind of throwing out as an estimate. I intend to have that policy be revenue neutral, and the reason why that policy becomes revenue neutral is when you look at the map and you see the impact of single parent households and you see how much more likely a child from a single parent household is to being a criminal that we end up paying to incarcerate versus being somebody that's in the system generating revenue and generating tax, this is an excellent investment. It, it, it comes from not paying money to incarcerate children from dysfunctional inner city single parent households, which is currently what we're subsidizing. We're, curr we're currently encouraging that because dysfunction is more likely to vote progressive. So we have this really nasty, vicious cycle where we're taking the money and then we're pushing it into bad things. So I want to take the money and I want to push it into good things, give the American people an opportunity to vote for that. If they want to do that, then they can vote for me and we can work about bringing those reforms. So my vision is a sort of robust package of uh, social programs designed to help restore the fabric of the nation. And it is going to have a cost and it's going to be related to our taxation, but it's going to have a substantial 
powerful effect and it's going to have a long-term dividend certainly in terms of how we feel but also ultimately economically as well you know we don't know what our economy is going to look like when we when we actually go back to the forces of nature women inspiring men to be industrious this is a very strong power that we've been diluting by kind of training men and women that they're actually the same and teaching them to interact as sort of roommates. So when we start unlocking these forces, it does have a very positive impact on the economy and the society at large. Capitalism is an excellent, again, mechanism for generating commerce. Let's get those engines turning and in a direction that is in accordance with a sort of biblical Christian moral compass. Well, you know, I'll, I'll sort of admit that the way that people treat me impacts how I feel about them. And most of the corporate CEOs that I see in America have a have a sort of naked contempt for the American people. So I'm not really interested in protecting their taxes, frankly. Um, so this model of defending corporate America, let's also let's recognize how the dynamic has changed in this country from where it was 30 years ago to where, you know, Reagan economics and and it was kind of war on the corporations and trying to bring them down. Now the corporations, they're all being occupied by these uh, cultural Marxists, essentially. I mean, these are the people that are promoting Pride Month in these celebrations. So, look, if you're if you're going out of your way to alter the values of the American people and to denigrate the basic Christian values, don't expect me as president to be looking out for you. I'm going to be looking out for the interests of the American people. And one of the things that is a very maybe bold concept, we have a lot of aspects of our society, a lot of sectors, as we know, that are directly tied to the Democrat Party. You know, aspects of the entertainment industry where we can't really – tell where the Democrat Party ends and the entertainment industry begins. The two things seem to be operating in lockstep. And we have all of the levers of power working in conjunction with one of the parties inside of the two-party system. And you have another party that is reacting to that so that they can continue to win elections, but they are being increasingly compromised. So we have these people, Bill Maher comes on, these progressives, and they're warning they're warning the liberals. They're saying, we've gone too far. You know, be careful. You might not like this when the shoe's on the other foot. My feeling is the shoe is kind of already on the other foot. So when big tech started getting involved in being the arbiters of truth and labeling things as fake news, real news, when the entertainment industry got in the business of telling the American people what our values are, in my mind, these sectors have already nationalized themselves because they are operating directly in conjunction with the current administration. So as president, I'm going to be expecting the same treatment from these sectors when I'm president. So my feeling is if your hand is in the cookie jar right now and you're telling the American people what their values are going to be, you have nationalized yourself and I'm going to be running to actually grab these entities, not just fight for them to stop blocking and censoring people, but actually to start using them to tell the American people what truth is our truth and who my truths are. As Democrats have the truths are, there's a title of something different for that, but we have a, a person whose job it is to define what the truth is. And the Republicans are up in arms about this is 1984. We need to get rid of this. Sure. I'm not going to get rid of that. I'm going to keep the truth czar. My truth czar is going to be a spiritual father for my church. And that's going to be the truth that we're going to be orienting around as a nation. And I'm going to be expecting all of these other aspects to work in conjunction with that. Because journalism is effectively dead. I mean, we know this. We know that the, the process of a neutral person that sits in the middle and presents the American people with both sides, that really doesn't exist. And the left, like all of these things, they're the ones that ruin that. Fox News is a reaction to that. Fox News is servicing the conservative base that is under attack from the left-wing media. This right now, this is the real journalism, is occurring on independent 
sources like yours that are simply having conversation. So these other things, they're already out of that business. So I think we need to just maybe recognize that and accept that and actually just demand that they service our government when we are in power. I think that's appropriate and I think it's necessary. And I think that at this point in time, it's a little bit too late for some of these companies to back away because they've already injected themselves into the American conversation in such a wholly inappropriate manner that we can't just expect them to go back to behaving decently. We're going to actually have to dictate to them as the American people what we want them to do. And by the way, we are entitled to do this. We, the people, have every right to implement a change like this using the constitutional process afforded to us by the founding fathers. And that's one of the things that my platform is, in fact, doing. I have put out the press releases and we're doing the media now. I am prepared to make an initial investment of my own into the campaign. Uh, but there is a responsibility. I need to see some buy-in first from the American people. So there is a natural apprehension from the establishment to hear from somebody like me because I am going after true disruption, not just maintaining the status quo so that they can continue selling their hats to the next generation of losers. So there is a little bit of a opposition against us getting the message out. And I have to punch through that opposition and connect directly with the American people, which is why I'm so happy to be on a program like yours with such an extensive audience. So we need to do that. And if that connection can occur to where we are able to force our way into the discussion, from there, I think the rest is going to occur very naturally. Because I do feel that the platform is superior. It is, in fact, the only platform and the party that is actually going to charter a new trajectory for a new American future. So that's where we're at right now. We're introducing the message. We need to connect with the American people. And then from there, we get into the nuts and bolts of winning the primaries. And then after that, obviously, we transition into the general election. So it's been a real pleasure being on here with you. I, I would love to come on again. Thank you for being very patient and getting me on here. Uh, God bless you and your audience. And I encourage anybody that enjoyed this conversation to go to Constantine. 2024.com. I don't do social media. None of the guys that I respect, I don't see them on there tweeting all day. So I'm old fashioned. I put out press releases and do interviews because these are serious concepts that require serious conversation. And I look forward to coming back on in the future, assuming that you're receptive to that. We could talk more sports, more politics, anything, but you're a good guy. God bless you and uh, love to meet up with you someday and grab a pint.